So, well, yeah, so I used to be, I used to help a rabbi in, uh, in, in Long Island. And uh, one time he was starting very late. And he came and he said, I apologize, everybody. I apologize for starting so late. And one of the uh, more vocal congregants yelled out loud, Rabbi, we don't care what time you start. We care what time you end. So I always thought that was good. I try to take that to heart. So just to give a little recap of what we spoke about in Tanya. We're trying, to, it's very technical, chapter one, but it's fun, very fundamental as it's chapter one, lays the groundwork. Um, Tzadik, Benini, and Rasha. Tzadik, these are types of people. And um, Rabba called himself, again, if you're new, we'll, I'll, I'll get you up to snuff privately, most likely. Um, so just bear with me now. A tzaddik, Rabbah called himself, yeah, Rabbah, the leader of the generation, Rabbah Bar Nachmeni, said, I'm a Bainani. And they said, what? If you're a Bainani, then who are we? A Bainani it's a, is defined as half the time he's sinning, half the time he's doing the right thing. If you're half the time sinning, then we're for sure sinners. I mean, you're like the ultimate uh, pious person in the world. So the Gemara says, not the Gemara, the Alter Rebbe, and Tanya says that there's no way a Bainani, which means the average, average, yeah, is half the time he's sinning. You, Rabbi can't make such a mistake to think half the time he's sinning when he calls him, he, he never stopped saying words of Torah to the extent that the Malach Hamavis, the angel of death, couldn't kill him. So he never once had a moment of sinning. So here we're holding that the... Um, What's the bottom line? The Bainini and the Tzaddik, the Tzaddik is a right, yeah, a righteous person. It's more than it's much more than that. The Bainini and Tzaddik on the outside look the exact same. They're never sinning in thought and speech and action, which means they're never thinking of anything but God or what does God want in thought, speech, and action. Now we're gonna get into thoughts. You're gonna uh, you're gonna say to yourself, what are your thoughts? I can't stop thinking what I, you know, things pop into my mind. That's not what we're talking about, what pops into your mind. It's what do you do after something pops in your mind? And they call them, they call them levushin. They call them thoughts, speech, and action. Machshava, dibar, maisa. Thoughts, speech, and action are called garments. Again, I'm going quickly because this is a bit of a recap. And just like in a garment, you can, you can take a garment off and on. Same thing with your thoughts, your speech, and your action. You can, you want to say something? Yeah, you want to tell the guy, you son of a, but you can stop. You can switch the garment. You can say something else. You son of a nice man, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So Rabba really, he thought he maybe perhaps he is a Bainini because on the outside, he didn't know it was, he never really did a gut check to see, am I really a tzaddik, a person that has no yates or hara, no inclination to do that, which is wrong. He just said, I was so busy studying Torah that maybe I, I'll give you a little sneak peek. He was so busy studying Torah, he didn't have time to sin. And that's actually a trick. You should be so busy involved in things which are so positive that you have no time to make a mistake. You have no time to sin. You have no time to go against the God, what God wants. Someone once came to the rabbi and said, you know, uh, I'm having trouble. I'm, I'm not doing what I should be doing. And the rabbi said, do I not give you enough tasks in the day? I mean, what the rabbi gave us is chassidim to do in a typical day is like insane. I, you, you can't, I mean... I do my best <laughs> to, to learn everything I'm supposed to do and talk to everybody I'm supposed to talk to and act the way I'm supposed to act. There should be no, the Rebbe said, there's no time. How do you have any time to do the wrong thing? You're so bu- you should be busy enough that you shouldn't have the problem. That's why lazy people, usually when you have nothing to do, that's when the problems start. That's when the YouTube channels, you start going to the wrong YouTube channels. You know what I mean? You got to stay on the right track. You got to be so busy, so involved. That you can't do the wrong thing. And that's why Rabba made that mistake, that perhaps he was a Bainani, that he wasn't really a tzaddik. And the truth is he was a tzaddik. So what does it mean a tzaddik is a person that most of the time does the right thing, like the Gemara says? The Gemara says a tzaddik is most of the time he's, uh, he's doing the right thing. Once in a while he does the wrong thing. A Bainani is half and half. Half the time he's doing the right thing, half the time he's not doing the right thing. And Russia is he always does the wrong thing. Those are called, here we go, Bahad Amrin Ba'alma, the Mechsa Al Mechsa Mikri Bainani. This that we say, the Bainani is half the time sinning and half the time doing the right thing. And we say the person who, yeah, majority of the time, 80% of the time he's doing the right thing, he's called a tzaddik. 
Hamushal. It's a borrowed term. Yeah, you call that dog. I just saw a dog walking down the street. I'm like, wow, that dog's a genius. I saw it. It's not a genius. I'm borrowing the term genius. It's a borrowed term. But we know what a real, I don't even know what a real genius is, but I, I can't imagine. But we know a real genius is like, is Einstein. The dog ain't doing equations in the street, I'm telling you. There's, there's, there's what the word really means. Yeah. Jerry Seinfeld always says, words have meaning, people. You can't just take words and do whatever you want with them. The, the Alter Rebbe is, is trying to define, he's going to define what is the Tzaddik and what is the Bainity. It's obviously not someone who's doing half the time this, half the time that. And a gen, What is a genius? We're going to have to try to define what is a genius. We have to try to define what a Tzaddik really is. And we're actually not going to define what a Tzaddik is so much. We're really going to define what a Bainity is. Why? Because that's who we could be. Now, most of the time, to be honest with you, try to be a baby. <laughs> but uh, even a Russia could be the nicest person in the world. The nicest person in the world. Um, yeah. In fact, probably most of the people we meet are what called Russian. Yeah, a bad person. But they're not a bad person. In the truest sense of the word Russia, Russia Vatoyvloy, like we said, Russia and there's good for him, meaning he's really a good guy. He's a really good guy, but Whatever, he messes up, he screws up once in a while. Yeah, he screws up a lot. He messes up a lot. Sound familiar? Yeah, that's what we can be a bainini. A bainini is, in our thoughts, speech, and actions, which we will get into in the later chapters, that's truly what a bainini is. So, um, but now, that was just a quick recap of what we did. I went quite quickly. Now, uh, yeah, what is really the uh, atzadik and a bainini? It's a world of a difference. It says about atzadik, his decisions are fully um, are dictated completely by his godly inclination, his got his selfless inclination. And we're talking about true selflessness, which we're going to define. True selflessness. I, I, to be honest, I don't even know. It's hard to know what that really means. Yeah, if you have children, maybe trying to do what's best for them. But maybe you could even say. I just want to do what's best for you because it's going to be, I don't want to hear the headache anymore. Yeah, I don't want, I want to make you happy because it makes me happy. That's also selfless, selfish, that's selfish. To do something purely for the sake of another, or purely for the sake of God, that is, you and, I mean, that is, I don't even know what that is. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I remember when I learned Tanya for the first time, I had a teacher and he translated the books into time. He translated Tanya books. And uh, he translated a lot of books into English. Most of the Hasidic books are translated by him. So I won't say his name, but you can probably figure it out. I thought, wow, this guy is teaching me Tanya. He's very calm. And I'm like, he must be a tzaddik, you know, or at least a bain. And then I remember like two days later, we were sitting at a Fabrengen, yeah, Hasidic mm-hmm. gathering. And I, I, just, I just remember catching a glance and he had a whole bunch of popcorn in his hand. And he was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I don't think he was a main thing. Anyway, don't think that I'm holding on these these levels over here. I mean, I, I like to think that I try. And, uh, you know, it says about a chassid. And someone said, are you a chassid? You say, I try to be a chassid. I'm trying to. It's a, it's a work. It's a, The word faith is a muna. Muna means faith. But where does that word, where does that word come from, a muna? Uman. And uman means a worker. Faith is something that you must develop. You're how are you you're a faithful person. That means you're constantly working on your faith. You're constantly trying to get in touch with that that, that godly spark in you, which we will talk about. Same thing, a chassid, a bain in the, it's it's a constant work. It's a it's a you constantly you're always it's gonna be like that for life. So don't think I'm I'm holding where it is, but uh, I'd like to think I try and I put effort into it all the time. Um, anyway, it says about a yetz. Yeah, the tzaddik is completely. Uh, dictated by his Yetzir Toiv. The Libi Chalubi Kirbi says, David Amelach, King David, my heart is void inside of me. In other words, right? What happened? He fasted so much. I'm not saying this is what you need to do. Don't do this, in fact. But he killed his Yetzir Hara, which means he was born with a Yetzir Hara, an evil inclination, and he killed it. He got rid of it. We're going to learn in chapter 10, uh, chapter 11, that. It's a gift from God. You you put in the most, just like everything in our, in our life, by the way, you do your effort and God does his part. You got to put, Hashem will bless you in all that you do. 
וברכת בכל, או ברכת בכל מעשיכם. השם will bless you in all that you do. In other words, you have to do something, and then Hashem will give you the blessing. You have to make a vessel. Yeah, that's what we're doing. We're doing a vessel, and then Hashem fills the vessel with the divine light, which means, you know, the bracha, the blessing that you need in order to, to, to make it accomplished. But you have to put in the effort. So here, in order to become a tzaddik, we're going to learn you can't just become a tzaddik. And in fact, our goal is not to become a tzaddik. Uh, and in fact, you're probably never going to become a tzaddik. Until Mashiach comes. But Hashem knew, Hashem, David and Melech, King David knew that he had the ability to become a tzaddik. And he knew what to do and the path he needed to get there. And he killed it. And then God, his Yetzir Hara. What does that mean? He killed his Yetzir Hara. He didn't actually, he turned over his Yetzir Hara. His Yetzir Hara now became, he has two Yetzir Tuds. Is that, is, we're going to find out what really happened. And that can only be give, given by God. Um, it says that he killed his Yetzirah. Okay. Now, we're going to get to the newest part. Yeah, the person who's not on this level, he says, uh, Hashem saw, and when he created the world, that there's going to be very few tzadikim. So, so he planted a few in each generation, they say there's 39 tzaddikim, I mean 36 tzaddikim, the Lamed Vovniks. You heard like an old old, uh, an old, Jew from Poland and Russia come up to you and say, you, you're a, a, you seem like a very pious person. Say, oh, you're a, a Lamed Vovnik. Your Lamed Vov is 36. Yeah, you, you, you're a 36er. Um, anybody who knows the mountains in, uh, in um, what's it called, in the Adirondacks, it's 46 peaks. Are you a 46er? So here, there's a 36er. So there's about 36 tzaddikim in every generation. Most of them we don't know. Um, you'll never see them. Um, I don't know why. It's just how it is. I have to look more into that. Okay, now, this is the newest part. Yeah, it says Chaim Vital. Who is Chaim Vital? The, prompt, the, the student of the Arizal. The Arizal... Rabbi Yitzchak Luria and Sfas, the, the Kabbalist of all Kabbalists, outside of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who wrote the Zohar. But Rabbi, yeah, you ever go to Sfas and the Arizal Shul and the Blue Doors? Uh, yeah, that's all thanks to Rabbi Chaim Vital. I mean, uh, to, to the Arizal. Now, the Arizal never wrote anything down. Who wrote everything down? His student, Rabbi Chaim Vital. The Rabbi Chaim Vital writes in his book, which you can know that he was quoting from the Arizal. So this is, Kab this is Kabbalah. The call Ish Yisrael. Every single Jew, every single Jew, Echad Tzadik Echad Rasha, whether you're a Tzadik or whether you're a Rasha, Yeshte Neshamas, you have two souls. Now we're talking, two souls, not two Yetzers, not a Yetzer Hara and a Yetzer Toiv, an evil inclination and a positive and a godly inclination, two souls. Like it says in Yeshayahu and Isaiah, the nisham, the nishamas an yasisi, the nishamos, plural, the nishamas an yasisi, said God. I made, I made nishamas. It's in the plural, shein shtei nefashet. Says the Arizal, these are talking about two souls. Every single person has two souls. Every single Jew has two souls. What are these souls? Yeah, you ever think, I have such a struggle within me. I die. You know, I want to do what's right. I don't want to do what's right. I've so, this. There's like two people inside. Yeah, talk to yourself. Maybe I'm the only one that talks to myself. But uh, yeah, you have the struggle. You know, struggle. That's because you have two souls inside of you. Nefesh achas metada klipa v'sitra achra. One soul comes from what's called klipa, and the Aramaic word is sitra achra. You ever heard of klipa? What is klipa? Let me explain what klipa is. Klipa literally means a shell. Klipa, the full word of klipa is klipas noga, the shell of light. Noga, noga means light. Yeah, a lot of Israelis have the name noga. So he has, what is klipas noga? What is a shell, according to Kabbalah? A shell covers over the main, the main, uh, element, the main substance. That's what a shell does. It covers it over. Okay, you might want to say it protects, but no, that's not what the definition over here is. It covers over. 
everything in this world, everything has a klipa in this world. What, what happened? What happened? By the sin of the Eitz Adas, the tree of knowledge, which we remember was not really a sin. If you remember my class, it wasn't really a sin. Never, the consequence of what happened when Adam and Eve ate the, from the tree of the tree of knowledge was that before they ate, everything in the world, um, everything, the, the divine, the essence of what everything was, was revealed. That's why Adam, Adam was able to look at, at, it says that Adam gave the name to all of the species. So yeah, like I always like to say, the dog was called a Kalev, Kuloi Lev, he saw. It was like all heart. It's completely, it's all about heart with the dog. The dog lives by its, uh, whatever its heart desires. It could be good, it could be bad. And that's exactly what happened. So now what happened was when the, the good became mixed with evil. What does it mean good became evil? Klipa became mixed with Kedusha. Th that which covers a shell, which, yeah, it's a, a shell means... It's just something that covers over what is really supposed to, uh, which, which was once revealed, is now covered over. That covered everything. In other words, godly, the godly essence of whatever was inside of all substances in the world, not just animals and trees, but certain thoughts and emotions and um, desires, the, everything in creation, these are all created entities, became covered with klipa. They had a klipa now. Now what happens is we get... We get, uh, and our job is to extract it, is to reveal the essence of what it is. And it's a very hard task because I don't know, I, the Torah tells us how to do it. And I'm going to tell you how to do it. You know, <laughs> talk is cheap, but I'll tell you how to do it. A lot of the time we get, we get caught in the external trappings. Yeah. We like to look at fashion and we like to, we, we get caught in that. Yeah. The person has no depth. There's something, or there's, I, I feel there's more to what's going on over here. That's because it's true. You're trying to get to the essence of what the, the, the entity is. Most of you, I would think, are on a journey. And you're trying to, whatever this world is providing for you is not enough. You're, the music, even the what you thought was very deep music, what you thought was very deep literature, what you thought was very deep um, ideas, suddenly it's still not enough. It's not getting to where you, what you're trying to get somewhere. You can't describe it, I'm assuming. And you're trying to get to it. That's because it's klipa. You have kli, it's too many. Now, klipa can be good, but you got to dig. You're trying to dig deeper. You're trying to dig beyond the klipa, beyond the shell. And what's another name for that? Sitra achra, the other side. What's the other? What does that mean? The other side. The other side means there's God. And then there's meaning God's face, so to speak, the revelation of godliness. And then there's that which does not reveal godliness. It's called the other side. There is nothing in this world called evil. Judaism does not believe in evil. Okay, you might see translations of the word evil. Even Ra, which is normally translated as evil, is not evil. Nothing is evil. It's just it because it covers over the godly essence, the, 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 the etzim of what it is, the essence of what is really going on behind that. So there's a soul that we have within us that comes from this place of klipa. That really, in the depth of it, there's a divine, there's a divine entity to it, but it's so covered over. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not in touch with its divine essence, so to speak. It's not, it's not in touch with it, and therefore it lives sort of for itself. It never feels satisfaction. That's why you never feel satisfaction by anything physical or material. Only spirituality can, can really satisfy you. It's, it, it lives for itself. And we'll, we'll, let me read a little bit further. And it'll become a little bit more clear with what I'm saying. Now, I want to explain, let me explain next time. This, this is called, we're talking about the human, the natural human soul. And it's called the nefesh of Bahamas. It's animal, it's literally the nefesh, the soul of an animal. What's an animal? Is an animal bad? Absolutely not. Animal's not bad. What is an animal? And therefore, well, therefore, what is a human? A human is, you could say, it's just a, 
the next level, it's just a fur, you know, a more developed uh, animal. An animal lives for itself. It lives for self gratification, self preservation, um, and it does. What is it? What feels good? What feels good for me? And that's what I'm going to do. Now you can do. Is that bad? It's not bad. Again, it's not bad. We need self. We need things that feel good for self-preservation. Um, we need things, yeah, if eating didn't taste good, yeah, you didn't have a desire to eat, you could say, uh, I might backtrack on that, but yeah, you might not eat. Um, whatever, there are other things that feel good for, in order for the continuation of the species, so to speak. That could come from Klippa. That I mean, that that is animalistic. How do I how do I explain that? Trying to translate the words in my head. An animal, a child. You see, from a child, a child is very selfish when it's first born. Why? Because it it the the nephish the second soul, which we're going to talk about, the anim, the godly soul doesn't fully come into the doesn't fully express itself. It's not fully accessible until it's the age of 13. Until then, the child only thinks about itself, just like an animal. Um, what is good for me? And being what's, what else could be good for you? Being nice to your neighbor is something that I know it's in my best interest to be nice to somebody else because it'll be, it's in my best interest to be nice to somebody else. That's why it, what, libertarians, okay? You might think libertarianism, whatever you have about libertarian. What's, some would say it's like there's a little bit of anarchy. That anarchy is not so bad. Why is anarchy not so bad? Because people will naturally want to help another. Just forget all the TV and the movies that you've seen, but they'll naturally want to help one another because it's in their own best interest. It, it, I, yeah, Stalin was completely neurotic, and I'm sure Kim Jong Un and and we know Saddam Hussein. These people were completely neurotic, they were paranoid because they were constantly harming other people and they thought for sure someone's gonna harm me back. If they would just cool down for a moment and say like, it's probably in my best interest to just do what's best for the people, and although it might seem as weakness. Okay, perhaps. Um, it, I will probably be more respected. I won't have such paranoia and I'll live a good life and they'll get a little, live a good life to them. But nevertheless, that comes from Klippa. That, why are you doing what's the motivating factor? Because it's for myself. What's another example of Klippa? A beautiful sunset. What's wrong with a beautiful sunset? The problem is, if you get stuck in the beauty of a sunset, you're, what, the sunset is not just for, it's not there for you just to enjoy it. In fact, that's probably why it gets old after a sunset. What, what, are, you, what are you gaining from that? What, what is, it's kind of shallow. It's like looking at a beautiful person or a beautiful painting, these types of things. It's only gonna reach so far. There's only, it's not, there's a, there's a deeper part going on over here. There's some, there's something deeper is what I'm trying to get at. And we'll get into, into chapter, chapter, chapters two and three and four. The, the animalistic soul is not only is it a place for where you could, good things can happen, also bad things. Yeah. That's egotist, egotism. Um, why, right. Animalistic. What's animalistic ego. And uh, anything that's going to pump you up, so you know, make you uh, make you seem bigger than you really are. So it says like this: there are four elements in the world. I know the periodic table of elements has seventy. The Torah has its own definition of what elements is, just like it has its own definition of what work is, work on job. So what is, what's its definition of of elements? There are four elements. There are. Um, Fire, fire, wind, water, and earth. If you want to know, we are Captain Planet. No, there's fire. What is fire? What what is what is the and, and these elements make up the animal soul. These anything in this world is made up of these four elements. So what are the bad? What what's something bad that comes from fire, so to speak? What are the what's the klepa of fire in the human body and the human psyche? Anger, haughtiness. These things that, yeah, they raise you up. I'm not, they don't need much of a definition. Yeah, you're like fire because you're trying to just raise yourself up and be better than everybody else. Tivus and Tainugim, things of uh, 
desires and uh, and pleasure comes from water. Like we know that somebody who has no um, enjoyment in life, we say that he's like a very dry person. You can understand someone who does have pleasure in life. There's like a moisture to him. He's got yeah. Sometimes you like to hang out with such a person. They got moisture. That's so dry. They got moisture. Pleasure and all these things they come from. Pleasure and desire come from water. Um, okay, frivolity and just um, speaking words of nothingness that comes from air, ruach, wind. As you can see, like there's no there's no depth to this person. There's no depth to this, and it's uh, atlas and atlas, depression and laziness come from earth. And the, and the reason why the animal soul, a person can feel all these different, uh, when a person's feeling any one of these, you know, I'm feeling haughty or I'm feeling lazy, I'm feeling frivolous, that is the, you can, you can for sure, you can be sure that's coming from the animal soul because the animal soul is made up of these four elements. Now, even there are good, um, there are good things, like we said before, that come from the animal soul, from these four elements, just like, it says that the nature of a Jew are called Rachmanim, Baishanim, and Goimli Chasadim. It says that the Jewish people by nature are compassionate, they like to do good, and are they get embarrassed easily. Yeah, Ruth Weiss, who's like a big uh, advocate for Israel, she says a Jew, the only time he raises his fist is to bang it against himself on Yom Kippur. In other words, we shoot ourselves in the foot. We're very embarrassed. We, naturally, we're very embarrassed. That's why it says when um, King David, uh, King, Shal, King Solomon said that we weren't allowed to marry the Gibonim, these Gibbonites. Why? What happened? They didn't, uh, they wouldn't forgive a certain, there was a certain story, and they wouldn't forgive these people that harmed them. That harmed them. They, they were very, very much anti-forgiveness. And King Solomon said, there must be something wrong over here. They must not be really Jewish. In other words, there were people who came and they said that we were Jewish and that we converted a long time ago, and it wasn't true. And uh, how did he see that? Because he saw by their nature, they weren't, they weren't easy to forgive. They didn't have compassion. And they weren't givers, natural givers. That all comes from the Nefesh Bahamas. That's an animalistic... Even though that's our nature, the Jew, a, a Jew, a nature of a Jew, that is still coming from the Nefesh Bahamas. That is not a godly, that's not a, that's not coming from the Yetzir Hara. I mean, the, that's not coming from the Nefesh Lakis. And we're going to discuss what the Nefesh Lakis is really in chapter two. And we're going to discuss more what this, uh, we'll, we'll spell this out a little bit more. Um, I just want to mention a few things over here. Um, First of all, does anybody have any questions? Okay. So just to give like a little bit of a... Uh, yeah. Hey, the, the nefesh, what was the second word for, for the name uh, of the animal? Bahamas. Behema. Behema means animal. Behema with a B? With a B, yeah. Base. My parents used to own a farm in North Carolina, and it was it was the town was called Bahama, North Carolina. I thought it was so fitting. Bahama, <laughs> North Carolina. Thanks. Uh, like the Bahamas, also Bahamas, animalistic. Um, so I just the, the what the what the Torah what the author Rebbe was trying to conclude over there was that the Yetzer that the Atzadik has a nefesh of Bahamas and a nefesh of Lakis. The thing is, the Nefesh of Bahamas is on board. You want the Nefesh of Bahamas, the animal soul, to be on board with you. Why? Because then, just think about an animal. An animal that plows, an ox. Think about how powerful an ox is. It, yeah, Tevya and the fiddler on the roof. Yeah, he, had to end up, he ended up having to carry his milk cartons, and he ended up, he was, his, his business went to shambles because he didn't have an animal that was strong enough to push it. He was able to push all that. He was was able to lift such heavy loads, you know. Take it was able to it was able to take him, the person, to a much greater place than he could have on his own. 
The Nefesh of Bahamas, the animal soul, if you can get it on board, can take you to places that you can't imagine. How do you get it on board? Very simple. The ne- very simple. Easier said than done. The Nefesh of Bahamas lives for itself. The animal soul just wants to do what's good for itself. If you can convince me that serving God is better than sometimes I want to get angry. It just feels good to get angry. Sometimes it feels good to boast. Sometimes it feels good um, to do a kindness for somebody else because they're going to say, what a nice person you are. If you can get that animal, you can convince him, look, you know what, you know what else is also good? Complete selflessness. Completely. I'll tell you why serving God is the ultimate. He'll be on board. Now, he might not always be on board, but you can get him. You can train him just like an animal can go against its nature. You can train it to go against its nature because it'll see the value in it. Okay, sometimes you have to hit the animal, and we're going to talk about that. <laughs> when we're talking about hitting the animal, what does that mean? When the animal just will not go. I am just, yeah, the highs, and the, high, the highs are high, but the lows are very low. How do you get out of the lows being so low? So the Tanya is going to address all that. But don't underestimate the power of the Bahamas. Don't underestimate the power of an animal. Don't underestimate the power of the human, human spirit. Not the godly spirit inside of you, but the human spirit inside of you can carry to much greater places than, than you can imagine. So we spoke, the, the, again, this is chapter one. It's all very technical. It's all very quick. It's all, we're, it's gonna, everything's going to get into great depth throughout the next chapters. So I just want to mention over here because we're out of time. The net klipas noga, the idea of klipa is a shell. It covers over the what is what's really at the depth, the essence of what something is, and that's found in everything. Everything has klipa to it. Let me give you, a, you know, an example that I heard. You wake up in the morning and you want breakfast. So you go downstairs and you make yourself breakfast. How do you ensure that when you want to eat breakfast, who's asking, who's saying I want to eat breakfast? Is it the Nefesh of Bahamas, the animal soul, or the godly soul? So it depends. I'm just setting this up for the next chapter. It depends. If you go downstairs because you just say, I'm hungry and I want some energy, that's the animal soul. The animal, I gotta feed, I gotta fuel the, I gotta fuel the beast. I need, I need, I need energy. I need to go. But the Nefesh of the Kiss would say, why am I eating? What am I eating? Am I eating here just to satisfy my own needs? Am I eating here just so my body will have energy? Or maybe I'm eating here to serve God. In other words, I need energy in order to serve God, in order for me to learn, in order for me to do whatever God needs me to do during the day. It's a whole different way of, of life. It seems very high, and it's and we'll get into the great depth of what that means and how to incorporate it in our life. And don't think you're going to get it in one shot. <laughs> Hopefully you'll get it. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll get it soon. Does anybody have any 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 questions? Uh, I do, Rabbi. Yeah. Um, so I read a while ago uh, about klipa, about everything, as you said, everything in this world has a, a shell, like a covering uh, or a klipa, and including your food. And, and in fact, that's kind of why when we always say a blessing before we eat, uh, does it remove the klipa or does it just give the the blessing just kind of uh, brings it to elevate the spirituality of the food? Great. It's a great question. In fact, I remember when my teacher taught me this, he brought that up. Is saying a bracha, does that remove it? No, not necessarily. Because you can have bracha, you can say a blessing without kavana, without the proper intention. It's all about, it's all about kavana. It's all about your intention. Kavana means intention. Well, I, you come into a yeshiva, yeah, you come into yeshiva with a lot of Hasidic Chabad little kids running around, da, da, da. they'll be saying a bracha in about a half a second. Yeah, you got your seltzer over here. And they're just, they're, just, they're just drinking. They're saying the blessing, but they're not really. They're thinking about, I need to get this water in my mouth. Okay, I'll say a blessing really quickly because I say it by route. It's all about the intention. Are you, in, in your case, there's many ways to, to reveal the spark that's inside or in other words, the focus is what's the essence? What is the essence of this over here? Why do I have, why do I want to drink something? The, the water has the ability, it could give me pleasure, but it also has the ability to sustain me in order to serve God. I'm, and you'll end up drinking a lot less than you probably would think. 
It's all about your intention. Why I'm about to drink. Why am I drinking? What is this for? That is more powerful than the blessing itself. The blessing is there to help you meditate. The only way you can do this is through meditation. The, the blessing is a formula to meditate about what you're about to do. Baruch. Yeah, Baruch means to draw down. What am I trying to do over here? I'm trying to draw down godliness. Atta. Which level of God am I trying to draw down? The level of Atta. The essence of God. Elikeinu. Baruch Atta. Yeah, of Havaya. Baruch Atta. Adenai. Yeah, the, the level of that part. Um, Shahakol. Who is this person? Shahakol Nia Bidvara. He created everything with his speech. And I'm trying to elevate that speech. God creates the world through speech. I'm trying to elevate that everything in this world is created through speech, except for the second soul, which we'll get into in the next chapter. That I'm trying to elevate. That's what God wants me to do over here. He wants me to reveal the speech, the words, the letters that he uses to create the world. He wants me to reveal it. Okay, that. Now you can drink some water. That That is elevating the spark. Just saying the, the bracha alone, the blessing alone is not enough. It's all about the kavana. The blessing is there to be a, a guide to tell you what to do. Anybody else? And we're going to get more into this. this. Again, chapter one is just laying down some a couple of words, a couple of facts. We're just trying to establish that a tzaddik and a benini and a rasha are not, uh, they're borrowed terms for most of the time. That's really the point. The second chapter is going to get into what is the second soul of a Jew? What is a nefesh a kiss? What is a godly soul? And how is it different from the animal soul? And why is it called the second soul? Um, and we'll get more. And we're going to define where the Jewish people are. Where do they come from within God? Where does this soul come from? What is What makes this soul unique? And I'll give you a little bit, just a little bit of a foretaste. Like I just said, God created the world through speech. Um, yep. Yeah. A bracious bar God created the world through speech. So the God spoke and the world came, yeah, or Hashem spoke and the world came into being. Um, that's speech. What is speech? Speech reveals a deeper deep, it reveals what you were thinking, right? A deeper part of you. I don't I can't see your thoughts, but how do I see your thoughts when you speak them out? It, but it's it's incomparable to what you're thinking, right? I mean, your thoughts, you have, let's say you have a million thoughts going on in your mind. Your speech maybe is what well, half a percent of what's going on in your mind, you know? But speech nevertheless reveals that which is coming from deep within, coming from within. But it says the second soul of a Jew, it, God blew into the soul of Adam, blew the soul into Adam. When you blow, it comes from a much deeper place. When you speak, you can speak for a pretty long time. But when you blow, you'll be out of, if you start breathing deep and blowing out, you'll get tired very quickly because it comes from much deeper within. And that is what the second soul is. And it's called the second soul because it's a guest. It's a guest. When a person, when a person is born, he's born the Nefesh of Bahamas, that animalistic soul, that is who he is from birth. So then over the course of the next 12 years, if you're a girl, or 13 years, if you're a boy, the second soul slow is the guest, slowly feels comfortable enough to start revealing itself. It takes a long time. Yeah, you go to someone else's house. You're not very comfortable right away. You're not going to speak up right away. You have to feel out the territory. That's pretty much exactly how it works within yourself. Um, and so their default is always the balabas, so to speak. The owner of the house is the nefesh el Bahamas, is the animalistic soul. That's the default. You're always constantly trying to put work into convincing the nefesh el Bahamas of what, what's good for him. And that's why it's very tiring and there's a lot of ups and there's lots of downs. But that'll be next chapter and we'll get into that next week. I highly encourage everyone to watch the previous videos, especially the newer students, because I went very quickly, as I usually do. Um, and, and get up to snuff over here. Okay, everybody have a good night. Tomorrow, Wednesday, I think is prayer. I think we, yeah, I think prayer in the morning. And then there's Marty Goodman, Mardukai Goodman in the afternoon, uh, guest lecture, uh, uh, not afternoon, 8 p.m. tomorrow night. All right, Zai Gezont, text me if you have any questions, obviously, more than happy to answer anything. All right, everybody, have a good evening.